the first step to solving a problem is acknowledging you have one. And for me, the executive order is really calling out something we've been saying for years that the big question coming into the executive order was whether it was going to be balanced, whether it was going to talk about both the risks and the opportunities of crypto. So I'm still thinking that we probably capture the downside in this 50% down bracket that we've been in with Bitcoin and ETH. Welcome back to Wealthy Value. The US government has pushed a total of $9 trillion into the economy since the start of the pandemic. With tax dollars so desperately needed, the IRS is looking to crack down on cryptocurrency. But what if you could trade crypto tax-free? Here's how to do it in 60 seconds. Step 1. Open a crypto IRA account with our friends at iTrust Capital, the world's largest crypto IRA platform with over $3.5 billion in transactions, over 1,500 positive reviews on Trustpilot, and no monthly fees. Step 2. You can transfer your existing IRA, roll over your employer plan, or make a cash contribution through ACH transfer, bank wire, or check. Step 3. Start investing. Available assets include not just Bitcoin and Ethereum, but also Cardano, Chainlink, Polkadot, and all major cryptocurrencies, as well as physical gold and silver. No taxable events mean no complex tracking needed, and security is the best in the industry. All digital assets are held in offline cold storage with the leading institutional custodians, Curve and Coinbase Custody, which are both insured and backed by the largest venture capital firms in crypto. Use our link itrust.capital forward slash value in the description below and get $100 in Bitcoin when you open and fund your account. The key takeaways is this is a really complicated situation. The yeah. geopolitics are terrifying, saddening, complex. The markets themselves are caught between that, inflation, a tightening Fed, slowing growth. It's a very complicated world. This is not the time for widows and orphans. This is not the time to make yeah. big bets because this is the time you will get carried out. So be very careful in what you do. You know, manage your risk very carefully. You know, so for example, I did the bond trade. I used options on TLT um, out to September because I've got a defined risk reward then. I can't lose too much. It's, you need to think in these terms in markets like this. So I've talked about this before and just updated it for Global Macro Investor, my research service, which is crypto users versus the internet. What we did here, well, Remy did it for me, was we started at 5 million users each. When they both hit 5 million, we then start measuring them. And what we found is that crypto has been significantly outperforming um, the internet in terms of adoption. We're way ahead of internet adoption. So if we just continue at a kind of slightly slower pace, we get to 5 billion users by the end of the, by the, end of the decade. So that's basically total adoption of crypto. So like the internet, we didn't profit. We couldn't buy tokens or shares of the internet. We had to find the companies that were going to win. The internet won, clearly. But here we can own the network, right? This is how powerful it is, which is, and it's, there's something called that. So that so Metcalf's law is the network effects. But there's the other thing called Reed's law. And Reed's law is when you build network effects upon network effects and you get true exponentiality. So if we're thinking here, we're building the we're building the foundation layer was the Internet. Then mobile data, 3G and all of that starts accelerating it and then and broadband and all of those things. And then you add the Internet of value on top. Of course, it's more exponential by its very nature. And the fact that you can own part of the network makes it more attractive for everybody to be involved. So in answer to right now, I don't know. The chart looks like it wants to go lower again and, and have another spike low. And that's been my, my, my view for a while. However, the crypto markets have not made a new low versus last year. And I think we've thrown 8% inflation, the market pricing in at 1.8 rate hikes, and um, and a war, and you haven't made a new low. It's like, okay, that's telling us something. Now, maybe that can change, but I mark that down as interesting. I've got a lot of technical divergences. A lot of the on-chain activity is very interesting. So I'm still thinking that we've probably captured the downside in this 50% down bracket that we've been in with Bitcoin and ETH. Here's a couple of assumptions. So what you can see is in 
the first six years, the internet grew at 70, 76% a year or 78%. Um, crypto has been growing at 117%. So it's much faster growth. So we're at 300 million users now. At the same point, the internet was only at 119 million. So you can see the scale of how this happens. So if we assume that suddenly everything slows down in crypto adoption and we grow at the same speed the internet did over the next four years, so this is now from year six to year 10, we get to 500 million users. If we just assume the ratio lower, then we still get to, you know, ridiculous numbers of 2 billion um, by by 2026. So it's incredible. And when you're growing at 100% a year, it's 4 billion the year after. So this is, I started, you know, I've been bleating on about Metcalfe's law, network effects, how to value these things. And it's very hard to do because Metcalfe's law is quite a complicated formula and you don't know what data to use. So I thought, I wonder if I can approximate it. And Remy and I went through all of the data for writing Global Macro Investor. And what we built was a network value model. The charts exactly fit that of Bitcoin. So we thought, okay, this is interesting. So basically the network is the amount of activity on the network, not in number of transactions, but in, in value that gets exchanged every day and the number of people exchanging value. So if you think of a network, if you've got one participant who's doing a billion dollars, it's not very valuable. But if you've got a billion dollars being done by 20 people, you've now got a network. I don't think it's all about money. It's the internet of value. That's why Web3 has become the narrative. So Bitcoin is a different beast and it's more of a reserve asset. Does it turn into a full, fully fledged medium of exchange and currency? Yeah, but that's not happening for 20 years. It's possible. I doubt it because governments want to own their supply of money. They want their own tokens for their for their own community, like everybody else is going to have tokens for their community. But, you know, I think as a reserve asset, Bitcoin works. But what we're actually talking about is the new is the way of storing, transferring and recording ownership and value in the digital age. Remember, I've had a few rants about the fact that the SEC was trying to stop people participating in this. It felt inclusive language. And I thought that was really important that they kind of acknowledged that that this is an opportunity for the broader public and they can't not allow it. The Europeans know they have a problem having dependency on foreign oil and gas. They're going to have to cobble together something, whether they do a backdoor deal with Russia or try and get more in from Algeria or figure out how to get it from Turkey, anything to keep it going. But given this shock, the one thing they have to do is get off oil and gas. So I do not think they're going to waver in their application of the EU ETS uh, carbon system. I think they need utilities, power producers, manufacturers, shipping, and all of the things that come under this to start um, allocating um, their efforts on greener energy, which is driving an investment cycle as well. And I know I, I see people all the time laughing at it. It's like, you know what, the world without having to use oil and using abundant sources is a better world. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. And that right. creates these supply issues because you've, you're pushing forward the narrative of ESG or trying to reduce the narrative of, fuel, of, of fossil fuels, but you, you've got a mismatch. And you're going to see these kind of squeezy prices until that happens. But yeah. over time, we will see a lot of technological advancements. People say, well, it's impossible. It's impossible right now to generate that much power. And the digitization of everything is the trend of the world and moving away from burning fossil fuels to digitizing the sun's energy is where we're going. And I don't think anybody should have a problem. It's not a philosophy for God's sake. It's just a efficiency over time. Now, when we first started it, it was much less efficient. The government's had to subsidize it. Over time, it's become cheaper even without subsidies. So it gets more efficient over time and that should continue to happen where the cost of electricity ends up falling and falling and falling. And that's, there's no philosophy to do with that. It's just a straightforward technology advantage.